What is up everybody? This is your guy Cly and welcome back to Budget Buys. And today I'm going to be talking about the CR840 from Kiki Studios. And yes, that is how it's pronounced. At least according to one of the reps I spoke to a while ago. The rep that actually ended up sending me this keyboard says it can also be pronounced Q-Key. And I think they just made that compromise due to the fact that a lot of people reviewing their keyboards have a section similar to this one where people talk about not knowing how to actually pronounce the company's name. They really should have just done like I did and asked them. Company name pronunciations aside, I do want to give a couple of disclaimers before I get any further with this keyboard. The first is the fact that Kiki Studios sent me this keyboard free of charge, though they didn't pay me to say anything in particular in this video. Despite that, I will be marking this as a paid promotion due to the fact that the free product can be seen as payment in kind. Also, as of the recording of this video, this keyboard is currently going through crowdfunding. And I try to avoid videos about products that are doing that, mainly due to the fact that this is a relatively small channel. If you're watching this video the day it goes live, I've got barely over 17,000 subscribers. As such, if you're expecting to use me as your primary marketing venue, you might be disappointed. However, I am willing to make an exception in this case for a few reasons. First off, this thing's just kind of cool. Next is the fact that when this video goes live, there will be maybe a week or so left in the crowdfunding campaign, and it's already been fully funded. In fact, if I recall correctly, this thing hit its funding goal the day it went live. So whether or not this video is a hit is not going to affect them negatively. Now, instead of doing my usual what's inside the box bit, let's just jump straight into this keyboard because as you can see, it is pretty much just a bog standard TKL keyboard. Though admittedly, this is not the way it came out of the box. Originally, it had all white keycaps. However, the arrow keys, spacebar, backspace, and escape key were all provided in the box by Kiki Studio in order to liven things up a bit. Okay, maybe I lied to you a little bit, because while it is true that these additional keys were provided by Kiki Studio, if you've looked at the thumbnail, you probably know that this is anything but a bog standard TKL, because over on that side of the screen, we have the star of the show. This is a touchscreen LCD, and it's pretty dang neat. Though, of course, there are a few other things over here, like the media keys over here with play, pause, previous track, and next track, as well as a center button that allows you to turn off the LCD. And we even have a speaker. More on that in a moment, because it makes more sense than you think. Also, before I dive headlong into the LCD, let's bring the keys back to the front and center for a moment so that I can just do a quick overview of the function layer, because I know how popular this part of my videos is. Though it is actually quite important in this video due to the fact that the keys do not have secondary legends printed on them. Now with this being a TKL, there's not gonna be as many function key combinations as there would be in something like a 60%. However, if you hold down function and hit either A or S, that's gonna to toggle between Mac and Windows modes. A brings you to Mac and S brings you to Windows. Function plus delete is going to become insert. Enter is going to cycle through your backlight modes. End is gonna bring up the custom backlight mode. The hyphen is going to reduce the brightness of your LED, while the plus is going to increase the brightness of the LED. Function plus the up arrow is going to increase the speed of your LED, while down arrow is going to decrease the speed of your LED. The left arrow is going to change the direction that the LEDs move in specific modes. Function plus the right arrow is going to change the backlight color between a small selection of colors. Function plus the Windows key will lock the Windows key, something that I always like to see on these keyboards. And finally, holding down Function and Backspace for around five seconds is going to reset the keyboard, like so. 
I should note this only affects the keyboard portion, not the LCD portion. That's done a little bit differently. Now, the reason I wanted to barge straight into doing the function layer is because a lot of the things you can do in the function layer, you can also do from the touch screen, especially in regards to controlling the LEDs. All I have on here right now are the original default apps, and those are an app that's gonna bring up my computer, an app that brings up your web browser, a calculator, a numpad. You also have the ability to use the touchscreen as a mouse with a handy guide on how to use it, as well as the ability to adjust your pointer speed. Over on this app, you have the ability to control the LEDs directly from the touchscreen, as opposed to using the function plus the enter key or the arrow keys. Not only are you able to cycle through the various built-in LED effects, but you also have the ability to cycle RGB on and off if you just want a solid color, specifically select the color, which is going to give you a lot more control than cycling through using the arrow keys, adjust the brightness, speed, and direction. Also, you have the ability to completely freeform design the custom light mode. Hitting this button once brings up the light mode, and hitting it again brings up the map that allows you to change things up. So if I wanted, I could go with what I already have there, or I can just run my finger across the touchscreen and all of these are going to be lit up. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see it, but as you can see, there are some red LEDs shining through, and don't worry, when I don't have studio lights on these, they're quite vibrant, and I'll show those to you shortly. And if I don't like that, I can either just go in and turn off individual lights or just completely reset it. Once again, this is a situation where you have the color wheel that will allow you to select any color you want. Now, the next one on the list is the on live app, but I'm gonna skip that for a second and go over to the settings app, which is where you're able to check the software version of the AOSP or Android open source project installation. Yes, this is running a stripped down version of Android. It also has a factory reset button in here. Do not do what I did while testing this keyboard and confuse that with the hotkey combination of function plus backspace. Instead of resetting the LEDs back to default like I usually do before recording these videos, it resets the touchscreen back to factory defaults, which set the language to Chinese, a language that I don't speak. Yeah. Fortunately, Kiki Studios does have customization software for the touchscreen that should be available to anyone who buys one of these keyboards. In that software, you are able to change the language back to English. Now, the last two features on the LCD that I want to talk about before I do on live, because that's going to go pretty deep, are down here. You've seen me using the back button multiple times, but there's also volume controls in the form of increase and decrease, and right here, we have a little slider that allows you to change the intensity of the LCD, which can be very useful if you're using it in a dark room. Now, let's talk about OnLive, because what this app is, is the command center for the built-in audio mixer. And I know some of you are probably wondering how the heck they squeezed that into this, because... There are no XLR ports or RCA coax ports or anything like that. Instead, what we have are these four color-coded 3.5 millimeter inputs. And they do a bit more than you'd think. Of course, we have the standard headphone and microphone port. And yes, I did point to the right ones there. The green port is the microphone and the red one is the headphones. Typically, what you're going to see in electronics is green for headphones and either red or pink for microphone, but just ignore that for now. Fortunately, the indicator lights on the keyboard are in the same position, so everything kind of works out. Also, the really cool thing about the microphone jack is that not only is this a powered 3.5 millimeter microphone jack, I am so happy about that, yet don't typically get those in the larger devices people typically think of as audio mixers, but it has a smart trick. 
By default, the speaker on the keyboard is going to be playing your system audio, as well as the audio from the other inputs and even the sound effects. So if I were to bring in my lav mic and hit one of the sound effect buttons, <laughs> you'll hear the audio come out of the speaker. If I were to plug something into the microphone jack, not only will the LED light up, but you're not going to hear anything when I bring in my microphone and hit the sound effect button. And that is because the sound card built into this keyboard has switched to headphone only mode. That being said, the sound effects and your mic feed are still going to go into your audio capture program of choice. This just means your mic's not going to be picking up everything coming out of the keyboard. And that's kind of cool. And for the curious, this is what I sound like when I'm recording using the built-in audio mixer. Now, I'm not using one of my expensive microphones. Instead, this is just the $5 Pulse desktop microphone from 5 Below. But you gotta admit, it sounds pretty good. The main takeaway here is that the mixer records at 48kHz 16-bit, which is pretty much the standard when it comes to audio quality, for use on YouTube as well as streaming. But it gets even better because not only are the sound effects and your system audio still gonna be coming out of the headphones, but so is your microphone feed with zero latency monitoring. And this is without a doubt my favorite microphone feature of all time. If you watch my microphone reviews, you're gonna hear me harping on about that every single time it comes up, and I'm going to do so today as well. For those of you that don't know, zero latency monitoring is the ability to hear your microphone's feed in your headphones with no delay. And the reason why I love this feature so much is because it allows you to use chunky closed back headphones and still hear yourself while recording. And this is going to make you sound more natural while recording. Because you might not realize it, but when you're speaking, typically you're subconsciously listening to your own voice. And when that input is gone, you're going to end up over projecting and even yelling in order to hear it through your headphones. This does not make for good audio while recording. Of course, you could just turn on listen to this device in your operating system, but because that audio signal is being generated by your computer from what it's listening to, there will be a slight delay in it. And if you're listening to your own voice with a slight delay, you're going to encounter an effect known as speech jamming. Until you get used to it, you're going to be stuttering and slurring a lot, and even when you do get used to it, it's going to still throw a lot of people for a loop. But enough about ZLM. Let's talk about these other two inputs, because those, like I said, are color-coded, and they go with a couple of cables that are included in this kit. First, let's talk about the orange cable. What this does is allow you to take audio from an amplified source, so let's say a cell phone or a music player or something like that and stream it into your audio feed. This will be captured by your audio software of choice and you can control it right here. And I completely forgot to mention that you can control the microphone feed here and your headphone feed here. Even better, unlike the microphone input, this is a proper stereo signal. I've tested this multiple times and the left channel goes to the left channel, the right channel goes to the right channel. It's actually very useful in situations when you're trying to capture stereo audio from a game or a music source. Also, if you decide to use pre-amplified microphones as opposed to a jack-powered mono microphone on the standard port, this will shunt the audio feed from the mics to the proper channels. Always a bonus in my book. Next up, we have the pink jack. And this one is pretty awesome because unlike the orange cable, which uses a TRS or tip ring sleeve connector for standard stereo audio. This uses a four connector or tip ring ring sleeve connector that you'll see in most cell phone audio jacks or laptop combo audio jacks. And what this does is output the audio from your capture mix over a microphone input in a cell phone or laptop or whichever device has one of those combo audio jacks. 
even better. You'll be able to hear the standard audio output from that device in your headphones through the mixer. And that audio coming from your laptop or your cell phone, whichever, is not going to be sent to your main mix. And this is kind of a big deal because let's say you're having someone phone in for your podcast or your stream. You don't want to loop their own audio back to them for the whole speech jammer thing, but you do want to talk to them or maybe play them sound effects or music or any of that. It works. It does its job well. The only real downside is that you'll need a way to capture their audio output as well, either on the device itself or I mean, you could do an audio splitter and then plug the audio out into one port and the audio in into the other, though you will be giving them a little bit of feedback. It's a give and take. And speaking of audio appearing in your headphones, but not in your recording mix, turns out if you're listening to your game audio through your headphones that are plugged into the deck, that's not going to be captured in your audio capture. This does pseudo mix minus. And as I've mentioned in a couple of videos, you're not going to find a mixer with a feature like this one where it's just straight up not going to be capturing for less than like $75 if you're lucky. Or if you want to mix it with a proper mix minus, that's going to be like $300. Of course, this is only talking about mixers where you're allowed to provide your own microphone as well as additional audio sources you can easily get a USB microphone, which will allow you to listen to your game audio through a jack on the microphone itself without capturing your game audio, while at the same time listening back to the mic feed in most cases, for a much more reasonable price, but it's still not super cheap. The world of audio devices is vast, and you're going to be making a lot of trade-offs. Of course, those USB mics don't give you things like different audio filters for reverb or equalization or pitch shifting or heck, auto tuning. Or what about massive soundboards? Not only do you have access to the ones that are in the home screen of this app, but you have a few others as well. Heck, if you go back to the home screen, you also have the ability to add your own sound effects like I did in the software earlier. Of course, it's launching an audio file from my computer, which is not in this room, so I can't play it for you now, but it does work. Oh, and I completely forgot to mention the fact that this also does Bluetooth audio. Well, receives Bluetooth audio. It doesn't transmit Bluetooth audio. But if you were to hook up your phone, tablet, computer, or something else to this keyboard, it will play out through the orange channel, so it does get captured by your audio mix, and if I'm not mistaken, it does so in proper stereo. Now, after all of that talk about the features packed into the touchscreen, I think it's time for an audio test for the keyboard itself. However, before I do that, I wanna just go ahead and show you the types of switches that are installed in this keyboard, and those are soldered in Huano Reds. Of course, this is an early model of the keyboard, and according to Kiki Studios, the final production models are going to have hot swap. So you're not going to be stuck with the Huano Reds if you buy this keyboard.
And there you have the CR840 from Kiki Studios. A little keyboard that has a touchscreen that is powered by a stripped down version of Android. And as for the asking price, the final retail price for this is planned to be $269. And that's not half bad if you take the whole thing into consideration. Especially since, while this is sort of a first of its kind keyboard with the dedicated Stream Deck, Razer did release a somewhat similar keyboard about a decade ago, that being the Deathstalker Ultimate. And that launched in 2012 for $250, which adjusted for inflation comes out to $318.27. And that keyboard, while it did have an LCD trackpad, as well as a series of LCD-backed buttons, it required Razer's software, whereas this is mostly a self-contained unit. Plus, it has an audio mixer built into it, and it's mechanical, whereas the Deathstalker Ultimate was a low-profile membrane akin to a laptop keyboard. Also, if I recall correctly, both the Deathstalker Ultimate and this model have plastic outer shells, which kind of makes sense with all of the touchscreen shenanigans going on inside. Also, if I do end up getting this video up before the crowdfunding campaign ends, you can get it at 26% off or $199. I'll leave a link to the crowdfunding campaign down in the description. Side note, I'm not getting paid for that. And if you're watching this video after the crowdfunding campaign has ended, I'll try to get a link to the actual sales page either down in the description or at the very least in a pinned comment once they're ready to start shipping. And I think I've definitely said more than enough about this keyboard. So until next time, this is your guy, Cly, signing off.